Jesus went out from there in Mark 6, verse 1. And he came to his own country. We're doing Mark, by the way, if you're new to the church or haven't been on Thursday nights, we're doing Mark verse by verse. His disciples followed him. Do we have any disciples tonight of the Lord? They followed Jesus. And when the Sabbath came, that's a Saturday, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? How many of you know he got these things from God the Father, the Word of God? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not just the carpenter? You see, this was his hometown. Isn't this just the son of Mary? Again, this is a review from last week. Isn't this he the brother of James and Josie and Judas and Simon? And are not all of his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could not do mighty works there except that he laid hands just on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled. He was astonished. He wondered because of their unbelief. And then he went about the villages in a circuit and he began to teach. You see, Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. He was wondering, Why in the world are they having unbelief? The Messiah is here. I am here. Jesus Christ the Son of the living God. The one they've been waiting for was in their midst. He couldn't believe that they had a lack of faith. I got news for you tonight. The same one that was there, he is here tonight. So there's no reason for us to have a lack of faith tonight because how many of you know the same God who healed then can heal tonight? The same God who saved then can save tonight. Hello, anybody here tonight? The same God who ministered then, how many of you know he can minister tonight? He is here. So don't have a lack of faith and don't have unbelief. Don't let the Lord tonight look down at us and say, I'm amazed at these people. I'm amazed at their lack of faith because I'm here. I am the Messiah. There isn't any sickness he can't heal. There isn't any circumstance he can't change. How many of you know there isn't anything the Lord can't do? He is here. Nothing is too difficult with the Lord. All things are possible through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Does anybody believe that tonight? you got to take authority over a spirit of unbelief and believe God can move. Does anybody believe God can move and touch your life? Now, let me give you one point on faith because he wants us to be people of faith. Turn to the person next to you and say, he wants you to be a man or a woman of faith. He wants you to be a man or a woman of faith. What is faith? What is faith? Faith is knowing the Lord will do it, but you don't know how he is going to do it. The Lord is knowing, the faith is knowing the Lord will do it, but you don't know how he is going to do it. You see, faith is knowing something for sure. We can know the Lord will come through for us according to his will and according to his word. No matter what your problem is tonight, you can know that you know that you know that you know that God is going to come through for you, no matter what it is. If your family needs salvation, he's going to come through for you. Do you need a few finances tonight? He's going to come through for you. Do you need a healing tonight? How many of you know he's going to come through for you? How many if you're glad you can know that you 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 know I'm going to keep going that you know that you know that he will come through for you I believe that I believe that but just think you may not know how he's going to do it do you have to know everything how it's going to be written out and how this is all going to work out Lord and I just need something right now well he might not do it right now Lord, I, I believe that I have this whole thing planned out, how it's going to look like, how it is going to happen, what is going to take place. You are setting yourself up for a fall. All you have to do is know this, Lord, I know that you are going to do it. I don't know how you're going to do it, but it doesn't make any difference to me how you do it. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It doesn't matter how it does it. It doesn't matter whether you go completely against my plan. I lift my hand to you tonight, and I declare that you are going to get the job done. Come on, does anybody believe God's going to do it? He's going to get the job done. We had, uh, Susie and I, we had an old car. And how many of you know you let your kids drive the old car? Just in case they get in an accident. And it was kind of banged in and there was a lot going on. But we owed quite a bit of money on it. And, uh, and just some things over the years happened. And I told Susie, I said, we got to get another car. It doesn't have to be a new car, but we got to get another car. But how am I going to do that? I can't do that till this car is paid off. So I said, Lord, I just know that you're going to provide for us. How many of you are glad tonight that you can know that God's going to provide for you? Now, I don't know how he's going to provide for me all the time. How many of you know Elijah didn't know how God was going to provide for him? But how many of you know God used a bird? He didn't have any food, and God raised up a bird and a raven. Can you imagine not having any food, and all of a sudden there's a knock on your door, and you open the door, and there's a bird there with food in its mouth. 
You say, that's crazy. That's what happened in the Bible. Now, how many of you know that God provided a, a, a stream for Elijah to have water? And when that stream dried up, guess what the Lord said? Go a few miles down the road, go to the city, and guess what God did again? He met a woman who may, had some food for him, and there was another stream there that had water in it. I got news for you tonight. Maybe your provision is starting to run dry, but I got news for you. God is going to take care of you because you can have faith in the Lord, knowing that he is going to do it, but you don't know how he's going to do it. So all of a sudden, it was a real foggy morning. Katie took off. She was heading to work. And all of a sudden, I got a call on my cell phone. It was Katie. I said, oh, what is it? She goes, somebody just smashed me in the back of the car. I said, oh, no. You know, as a parent, you start to get a little bit angry. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe it smashed in the back of the car. I drove up there. Is everybody okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Fine. And the person took off, but it was smashed in the car. Long story short, we took it into the insurance. The insurance paid off the car. We got enough money to pay off the car. I, I couldn't believe it. We got enough money to get another car. And I got enough money to put some in the bank. All because of a car accident. How many of you know you never know how God's going to do it, but aren't you glad he's going to do it? Come on, anybody need some finances? Anybody need a job? Anybody need your family saved? Anybody need a healing? Come on, are you going to believe God's going to do it? You say, Pastor, I don't know how he's going to do it. You don't know how he has to do it. He is going to get it done for you. Just believe the Lord that he's going to get it done. <laughs> believe the Lord. Believe the Lord. Let me give you a couple of biblical examples. Moses. God came to Moses. Moses, deliver the people from bondage. Deliver Israel from Egypt, okay, Lord, I'll go ahead and do it. But how is it going to get done? How in the world is it going to, are you going to get, they, estimates are three to six million people, Jewish people, were in Egypt. How in the world are you going to get, let's just say, five million people out of one country and take them to another country? And guess what the Lord said? He said, Moses, number one, I'm going to use one person. He said, who, Lord? He said, you. And then Moses gave a bunch of excuses. How many of you know we all give excuses why we can't be used by the Lord? But the Lord moved all those excuses to the side. And then he said, Lord, how are you going to do it? Guess what God did? He gave him a stick. I want you to take this stick, and you're going to go to Pharaoh of Egypt, and you are going to be used by me to deliver 5 million people out of Egypt, and you're going to take them up to Israel. And wasn't it amazing when Moses took that staff and put it down in the Red Sea? All of a sudden, the Red Sea parted, and when the Egyptians were coming after him and Israelites escaped, the Red Sea came, up, came against them and destroyed all of the Egyptian army. Just think, a stick destroyed the Egyptian army. That was number one in the world at that time. A stick, a piece of wood. Moses said, God, I'll go ahead and believe you for it. But Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it. And God said, I'm going to use you, Moses, and I'm going to use a piece of wood, and we're going to defeat the Egyptians. How many of you are glad tonight that some of you don't know how the Lord is going to come through for your situation? But I can guarantee you that he is going to come through for your situation. You don't need to know how. Have faith in the Lord. That's not everybody. Come on, have faith in the Lord. <laughs> Can I give you another example? Oh, I like this. Another example, Mary, little Mary, a teenager. All of a sudden, an angel came to her and said, Mary, yes, what is it? She was trembling. It's in the Gospel of Luke. You're going to have a baby, and he's going to be the Savior of the world. And she looked and she goes, okay, Lord, can you imagine a 13, 14-year-old, an angel coming saying, you're going to get pregnant. And you're going to have this little baby. And she said, okay, Lord. And then all of a sudden she goes, but how in the world is this going to happen? How many of you are glad tonight that you can know the Lord's going to do what he's promised you to do? You might not know how he's going to get it done. Does anybody really care how he gets you the job? Come on. Does anybody really care how he heals you? Does anybody really care how he takes care of you financially and brings more customers in? Aren't you glad he's just going to do it? Don't worry about the how. Just put faith in the Lord and trust in him and know he's going to get the job done. So all of a sudden, the Lord came to Mary and said, Mary, you want to know the how? I'll tell you the how. I am going to impregnate you with the Holy Spirit, and you are going to have a baby without a sexual experience. Whoa. 
I don't think there's anybody in the church that has ever had a baby without a sexual experience. <laughs> that woke a few of you guys up. Sex, huh? Can't wait to get home, Martha. <laughs> Boy, everybody's alert now. Look at that. We got some pep. We got some pep going on. The tiredness lifted on a Thursday night. Woo! I guess instead of saying the word revival, we got to use the word sex once in a while in this church. <laughs> That'll bring some revival. So all of a sudden, Mary said, oh, my goodness, I can't believe this. I'm going to have a baby without having a sexual relationship with the man I'm betrothed to, Joseph? And the Lord said, yes, because I'm a miracle worker. Mary, don't you worry about the how. You just put your faith in me. So guess what Mary said? Okay, Lord, I put my faith in you. I don't care how you do it. I just want to be used. If you want to impregnate me through the Holy Spirit and it's a miraculous birth, then so be it. If you want to do it a different way, then so be it. Because a lot of born-again believers today, you are so involved in how it's going to happen. And you are worn out. And you are worrying. And you are troubled. And you are anxious. Get out of wondering how he's going to do it. And just say, Lord, you are going to get me that job. You are going to put my marriage together. You are going to get me those finances. You are going to take care of this situation. You are going to turn things around. I don't know how, but you are going to do it. I leave the how to you. Oh, come on. That's worth running around the sanctuary tonight. <laughs> oh, that was verse 7. It's verse 6. Let's go to verse 7. He called the 12 to himself, in verse 7, called the 12 disciples, and he began to do what to the 12 disciples? Yeah, he got rid of the unbelief, he got rid of all the worry, he got rid of all the anxiety, and he says, now that you guys got some faith, now I can send you out. You see, they were in a training center. How many of you know it's good to go to a training center? It's good to go to the school of ministry. From Mark chapter 3 to Mark chapter 6, he's training the disciples. It didn't take 10 years of college. It didn't take all this going on. doesn't mean you don't go to college. doesn't mean you don't get trained. I believe in college. I believe in education. But I also believe in Jesus' education. And so if you'll notice here that these disciples were in a training from chapter 3 to chapter 6. Now, after training, he says, look, I'm going to send you guys out. What was he talking about? He was talking about evangelism. He was talking about going out. He was talking about moving out. If you'll notice here, he says, I'm going to send you out. He says, I'm not going to keep you in a church. I don't want you to stay. How many of you know two-thirds of God's name is go? So for all of us in this room today, we might be a part of CCWC, but he didn't say stay. As soon as we leave this place tonight, we are to go to our neighbors. We are to go to our friends. We are to go to our family members. We are to go to our coworkers. We are to go to our bosses. We are to pop the question and tell somebody about Jesus. How come everybody's not praising? That's for all of us. That's for all of us. And how do we go out? Look what it says here. Two by two. Just think how many teams we could have to go into neighborhoods if two of you could just hook up together. That's all you need is another person. We'll train you. We'll show you how to do it. It'll just take a couple hours. And just two of you. How many of you know you could all go out two by two? Could I see your hand lift up? Just two people, an hour a week or an hour every other week. Just two people. Take a friend in the church. We're going to go to a neighborhood. We'll get with Tara. We're going to go to a neighborhood. Just think if we had 500 people two by two going out in Newport Ritchie and Port Ritchie sharing the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> Guess what would happen to the drugs in our city? Ooh. Guess what would happen to crime in this city? Ooh. How many of you know the president and everybody would be here saying, what's going on in this city? What are you guys doing to get the crime rate down? What are you guys doing to get the girly joints closed? What are you doing? The abortion rate is almost nothing. I'll tell you what we're doing. We got 500 people going out on a regular basis telling people about Jesus. And when people get saved, they don't do drugs anymore. <laughs> Come on, when people get saved, they don't abort babies anymore. Hello, anybody here tonight? When people get saved, there's no girly joints anymore. Nobody's going. <laughs> you say, Pastor, I can't do this. I got news for you. There are only I can believers here at CCWC. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
I have a little bit of money, and I pulled in, and uh, I was doing something for somebody. They gave me a little bit of money. I went to the bank, put in $50, and at the end of it, she simply said, is there anything else I can do for you? I said, there sure is. Get saved. <laughs> Her eyes just kind of got dizzy. Whoa, whoa. She goes, I got a lot of other people to help. I got some things to do. I said, that's fine, but you asked me if you could do anything else for me. And there is one more thing you can do for me before I leave. You need to know Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. And again, I can tell she just wasn't ready. And No, I got to work. I got to get one. I said, that's okay. But I said, I want you to know, I told you that you need Jesus. I told you that you need to be born again. I told you that you need to get saved. I told you because I might not ever see you again. And I want you to go to heaven. I don't want anybody to go to hell because hell is real and heaven's real also. How many of you want everybody to go to heaven? <laughs> Turn to somebody next to you and say, you need to get saved tonight. You need to get saved tonight. And look what he did when he sent them out. Thank the Lord when he sends us out. Do you know what the number one enemy is in the church today? Going inward. It's the number one enemy of every church going inward. Because guess what we want to do? We want to have a great time and, and feel all the Holy Spirit goosebumps. Don't they feel good? All those Bible studies we want to have, which is good. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with coming and eating eggs and bacon this coming Saturday with the men's group. But you know what you can do? Why don't you bring two neighbors with you to the men's group? Because there's going to be a little Bible lesson, and they're going to get scrambled eggs. and Or egg, we'll give you can do eggs over easy, whatever you want. And we're going to give you some bacon, and then we're going to give you some salvation. <laughs> and you can get some men saved and filled up. That went over like a lead balloon, but it's still true. And if you'll notice here, it says that when he sent them out, look at this. He gave them what? He gave them exousia. The word power here is not dunamis, miraculous ability. The word power here is authority. So he said, I want you to go out two by two. And many of you tonight, you need to come up and see Tara or Angie, and you need to say, I can go out by two. I can go into a neighborhood. We can all do that. Even if it's once a month, take a couple hours and go out. You say, Pastor, I can't do it on my own. That's fine. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to give you power over unclean spirits. You don't have to fear. How many of you are glad when you go out and knock on the door, he's given you all the power you need to stand up against powers of hell? All the power that you need. You say, Pastor, I'm scared of the sin and the enemy. When you start knocking on the doors and you realize the power of God that's in you, the enemy and sin will be scared of you. You won't be scared. Uh, they won't be scared. You'll be, they'll be scared of you. You won't be scared of them any longer. And as you go, you can pray and use your authority and don't let the enemy stop you. Oh, don't do that. And look what he did here in verse 8. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two pieces of clothing. Do you notice what he did here in verse 8? Look at this. He gave them a command. I don't know about you, but when the general of the army gives Bill Strayer a command, guess what I have to say? There isn't any, how many of you are believers tonight? Can I see your hand lifted high up in the air? Because I am too. Well, the general is commanding all of us as believers tonight to go. I'm not commanding you to go. Jesus said what? I command you to go. And when you go, I'm giving you all authority and all power to go. And guess what? You don't even have to take anything with you. And man, when I read this word command, I mean, I've read these verses over the years over and over. But when I read that word command, I said, Lord, I don't have a choice. I, I don't have any excuses. He has commanded me to go. So guess what I have to do? I have to adjust my time to be able to go. Isn't it amazing today that most believers will not, just, will not adjust their time for spiritual things, but they'll adjust their time to do anything else? I believe the church of Jesus Christ needs to adjust their time to go into church, adjust their time to go out and witness, adjust their time to do some spiritual things, because Christianity is a little bit of sacrifice. Christianity isn't totally convenient. 
So I'm going to have to sacrifice a little bit of family time. Not a lot because I'm not going to lose my marriage or kids. But I'm going to have to sacrifice some family time because maybe somebody wanted to do this with the family. But Susie, there's a second Saturday outreach. So guess what? It's only an hour and a half. We're going to go to the second Saturday outreach. And we're going to win some people to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> Should I stay here for a while? I only got three amens and they're people I pay. Can I look you in the eyes and say a little bit of sacrifice is good for born-again believers that live in the United States of America? A, li a little bit? How about a little bit more? How come everybody's not praising? A, a little bit more sacrifice? So guess what Jesus said? Oh, I really want you to go. Would you please go? No, I commanded them to go. And when you go, take nothing for the journey except a staff. You see, this was just a small journey. It wasn't a long journey. But he says, I don't want you to take a bag. What's that bag? That was a begging bag. He says, don't take any begging bags because I don't want you to think, I don't want people in the community to think that you're after their money. We are not after their money. Do not take a begging bag. Do not ask for money. Do not go for money. Do not even hint about money. You are there for one reason, not even to get them to your church. You are there to bring them to Jesus and get them into the kingdom of God. So do not beg and don't take any money. And I got some news for all of you, and I say this with all of my heart. We've been here for 27 years. We are not after your money. That's not why we want you to come. Yes, we're going to teach on tithing and giving, but that's between you and the Lord. But I do have news for you. As long as the Lord wants us here and we fulfill his vision and we follow him, he will provide every need for CCWC, whether you give or not. <laughs> Hello, is anybody here tonight? He's the provider. He is the provider. So he said, look, travel light, travel light. I will provide for you. Don't beg for money. Take some clean clothes along the way. And listen, you don't need to take any extra food at all. When we do Awake America 365 trips, guess what? The Lord always provides. He provides. We, put, we get missions. We get mission support. We sell teaching tools. But he always provides. We went to a church in Indiana, and I had a lack of faith. It was a very small church. And I said, Lord, there, there's no, this offering's not going to, man, we're going to go on the whole. It's going to be terrible. And the Lord just spanked me. Oh, man. How many of you have ever been spanked by the Lord? He said, number one, Bill, you're not doing this for their money. So that was one whooping. And the second whooping is, he says, can I use even one person to give you a $5,000 check? You don't need to have 1,000 people. How many of you know you can go to a church and preach and there's 1,000, you get $1. There's 30 people and they give you $5,000. So he says, don't count the people. You just do what I've told you to do. Get your attitude in check. And believe in me, and I will provide for you. So we did ministry, and we poured our house, hearts out. We preached up a storm. People got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People got saved. We, had to, we stayed. We got our own place to stay, and we paid for our own air flights. I said, Lord, I don't care. I just know you're going to provide. You called this ministry. He handed me the check afterwards. I didn't even want to look at it. I know it's going to be $1.50. And we had another team that was up in New York. So I said, Lord, you know, we want to just keep the finances flowing. So I opened it up, and it was a check for $1,500 from a very small church. And it took care of our trip, and it took care of the trip in New York, paid for everything, and a little money left over that we could go on the next trip. Oh, he whooped me. How many of you know the Lord's a provider? So he said to these people, Lord, the Lord's going to provide for you. Also, he said to them, in whatever place you enter into a house, isn't that amazing? So as they go, this is just good teaching for the Awake America 365 team. In whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. So he said, look, when you go into a town, when you go into an area, you can stay in that house, a house that knows me, a house that has received me. A house that is, is pleasant or a house is, that is uh, open to the gospel, you can go ahead and stay there. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from that place, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. So back at that time when there was a rejection of a doctrine, when you got to the edge of town and they wouldn't listen, the disciples would actually do this. And they would say the judgment of God is coming upon that town for the rejection of the gospel. How many of you understand that when somebody rejects the gospel, he said, look, just, dust the, just take your hand and dust, the, the, uh, dust, uh, dust the feet, their feet, and take the dust off. And it was a sign to each and every one of those people. And they knew that sign that was there of the rejection that the judgment of God was going to come upon that 
that town. You say, well, pastor, that's mean of the Lord to judge them. No, when they did that sign, it would bring some good godly fear into their hearts. So guess what some of those people would do in that town? Man, I'm just realizing that the judgment of God's going to come upon us, that they were really preaching the truth, and it would bring them to repentance. How many of you understand the fear of God is a good thing, and it's a God thing, because it brings people to a place of repentance that they'll actually come to know Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord. So when the disciples were leaving that town, when the disciples were leaving that town and the town saw them shaking off the dust, guess what? They started to fear. They said, wait a second, maybe this is true. It's like when Jesus was on the cross, a lot of the Romans looked at the cross and said, oh my goodness, he is the son of God. Truly he is. So when they left the town and they made that sign, a lot of the people in the town, wait a second, what they are saying is true and what they are saying is right. I better receive Christ as my personal Savior and Lord. And many people were born again and many people were saved as they went to these towns. And so they went out in verse 12 and they preached that people should do what? Yeah, they went out and preached that people should repent. Let's all say that word together. That's a hard word to get out of our throats, isn't it? They preached. They preached with confidence. They preached with authority. They proclaimed the king's news that people should repent. Everybody teach me. What does the word repent mean? Change your mind. How many of you know to be saved, you got to repent? When Jesus came along, guess what his first message was? Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. When Peter came along, guess what his first message was? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. When John the Baptist came along, guess what his first message was? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So all of a sudden he said, look, I want you to do what Jesus did. I want you to preach. I want you to tell people that they need to change their mind. They need to change their mind about the way they're going. They need to change their mind about the sins they are committing. They need to change their mind that there are many ways to heaven when there's only one way to heaven. They need to change their mind that works will save you. They need to change their course that they're on. They are headed the wrong way. They need to think differently. They need to reconsider what they believe, and they need to come to know Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. And it's not only needed here, but how many of you know it's needed in Newport, Richie? It's needed in our schools. It's needed in every church in America. And not only preach, but look at this. As you go preaching, I also want you to cast out some demons. How many of you know there's some demon influence out there? You say, Pastor, I don't know of any demon influence. Does anybody know anybody cutting themselves? How many of you know somebody that's cutting themselves? Can I see your hand? Look it up. Look at all those hands lifted up. You know what that is? That's demonic influence. We just read about it in Mark chapter 5. The man who came out of the tombs was cutting himself. So when you know a young person that's cutting themselves, yes, they might need counseling. That's wonderful. Yes, they might need some wisdom. That's wonderful. But they also need a born-again believer laying hands on them and take authority over the demonic influence that is causing them to cutting themselves and taking their lives. How come everybody's not praising the Lord? you got to have the spiritual in there too. Do you know anybody that needs some deliverance from drugs, from alcohol, from meth? Let me see your hands lifted up in there. That's a lot of hands. Guess what? It's demon influence. They need to be set free from the power of the enemy. Anybody know that there's prostitutes walking the streets of Newport Ritchie? Have you ever driven on 19 south of Ridge Road? Just drive on 19 south of Ridge Road on a Friday and Saturday evening. A lot of prostitutes out there. You say, Pastor, what are we going to do about it? We have a group of ladies that go out there and witness to those prostitutes. How many of you know they need Jesus? How come everybody's not clapping? They, they need Jesus. How many of you know God created them? They're human beings. It's demon influence. There's people bound by religion. There's people that are not saved. And I'll end with this. And they not only cast out demons, but look at this. They anointed with oil many who were sick, and he healed them. They anointed people with oil. I've been keeping this anointing oil up here, not to annoy people, but to let people know that after the service, we will anoint you with oil. The Bible says, come to the elders, and when the elders anoint with oil, the sick will recover. We believe the word of the Lord. Does anybody else believe the word of the Lord? I believe it. 
Look what it says here. They anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So what did the disciples do? They obeyed God. You say, Pastor, I can't heal anybody. I can't cast out any demons. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is obey. You're not the one who heals. You're not the one who casts out the demon. It is the power and authority of Jesus Christ. All you have to do is lay hands on the sick and pray. All you have to do is take authority over the enemy. All you have to do is obey the Lord. All you have to do is ask somebody if they want to know Jesus, and it's God that does the work, and he will use you to do a great work through you. Come on, everybody thank the Lord. He will do that work. Jesus does it. When we go on an Awake America 365 trip, again, we got a team in Detroit right now. They're all laying hands on the sick. A couple of them came to me before they left because they're in my new leadership class. Pastor, I don't know if they're going to get healed. It's, it does, it's not up to you to heal them. What does the Bible say that all of us in this sanctuary can do? All of you can anoint with oil. Get some olive oil at home. Get a little tube. Put some olive oil in it, lay hands on it, say, Lord, when I anoint people with oil, I'm obeying your word. I'm believing pe for people to get healed. And start going out and laying hands on people. And start going off and laying hands on people if, they're, if it's really demon oppression. And how many of you know that's all you have to do is obey what God told you to do. And if you will obey what God told you to do, Frank hit it on the head in prayer meaning it's not by might and it's not by power but it's by the Spirit of the living God that things begin to happen.